Hello, everyone. Um, everybody saw the video. I was playing that last night at my house, and my wife was uh, in the kitchen listening to it. And I came on, and she listened. She goes, who is that Howard guy? He sounds like a complete idiot, OK? <laughs> so uh, that's what I have to live with at my house, all right? <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about these things, uh, Network Defender's future. I want to talk about, uh, in order to understand where we are today in our industry, we need to know how we got here so we can see what those decisions were. So uh, I know you all think you're kind of technical because you're cybersecurity people, so I'm going to give you a quiz to see if you're qualified to be in this room. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about geeks versus non-geeks. Uh, reaction to a flaky internet connection at your house. Now, we, now, I got this off the internet, so you know it's true. <laughs> this is the best joke I have in the deck, so if you're not laughing now, you're going to be in a bad shape by the end of this, right? Okay, uh, we're looking at this graph. We have two axes. The y-axis is how much hope that we have that we're actually going to solve this flaky internet connection. And the x-axis is time, how much time goes by before we do solve the problem. All right, we get two populations, the non-geeks and the geeks. The non-geeks, they're the beautiful people. <laughs> Look around the room. These are not you people, okay? And we got the geeks, or the non-geeks now, they're an optimistic group, right? So uh, they're, they figure they're gonna solve this problem and they go with the tried and true model of wait a little bit longer, it'll fix itself. But even when that doesn't work, uh, they start to lose hope a little bit and they come up with the brilliant idea, I know we'll call our internet service provider because those people are always so helpful. <laughs> Their optimism skyrockets, but the real reason it skyrockets is because they know their nieces and nephews are going to show up at some point and they'll fix it for them. So those are the non-geeks. Now, the geeks, these are my people. Right? I like to hang around with them. And, you know, we're going to fix this problem, right? So we're going to reload the website, reload it again, try another site, reload that site. Okay, check the network settings. And when all else fails, what do we do? Yes, we reboot the Wi-Fi router. Okay. <laughs> because that fixes everything, all right? And when it doesn't, we're gonna break out the real networking commands, okay? And when then that doesn't work, we're gonna go to our non-geek friends and wait a little bit longer, maybe it'll fix itself. And then we're gonna call the internet service provider because those people are always so helpful. But instead of our optimism rising, we fall into the pit of despair, all right? So that's, those are the two populations. Show of hands, how many people are the beautiful people? Come on, you could admit it. One guy in the back, all right, try, oh, two guys, all right, fantastic, three. Okay, look, they're, yeah, they're all, uh, yeah, all super geeks, but also beautiful people. All right, how many people are the non-geeks, or the geeks, I'm sorry? Yes, the rest of us. All right, so by the power invested in me by the state of California of the Fear, Uncertainty, uh, and Doubt Committee, I hereby certify you are qualified to hear the rest of this presentation. Okay, whew, that was a long one, sorry. Now that you're all woken up, I wanna talk about what I think are three evolutions in our in industry and how we have progressed. Okay, so in the beginning, the internet really started around mid-1990s, okay, because you know, eBay came online, Amazon came online, we had SSL certificates to encrypt everything. So that's right when it became useful for commercial vendors and government organizations to use the internet for business operations. That's about the same time that adversaries came online and said, you know, we can use it too. So organizations started hiring people like us, network defenders, to protect ourselves from these uh, cyber adversaries. Now, we had some help with tool sets, uh, we had Dorothy Denning here. She invented the first intrusion detection system back in 1985. Uh, we got Burn Fix, uh, first antivirus system. He's the first person that I could find that actually wrote code to remove a virus from a computer, so we'll give him credit for the first AV system. And I'm going to give Fred Cohen the tip of the hat for inventing defense in depth. Now, that's not exactly true. I was trying to find the person in the cybersecurity community who came up with defense in depth. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, defense in depth. We'll come to it, okay? But I couldn't find it. I looked around for a long time. I finally put it out on social media and said, anybody know who invented the phrase defense in depth for cybersecurity? And all the military people came online and said, oh yeah, we invented this in the 2000s. Any old timers in here? You know, that's way too late, right? So I kept looking, finally found a paper written by Fred back in 1989. And he didn't say he invented the term, but he said people are using it to describe to their bosses how they do security in their organizations. So that didn't really prove it. 
So I called him. Anybody know Fred? Okay, he's still around here, right? I called him on the phone and said, hey, Fred, are you the guy? Are you the guy that invented defense in depth? He said, no, I didn't invent it, but I'm probably the first guy to write it down. All right, so he's the first guy. We're going to give him credit. All right, uh, I'm going to give firewalls to these guys. Now, if you go on the Internet and look at who gets credit for the, inventing the first firewall, you will realize there's a giant scandal about who gets credit for that. All right, A bunch of commercial security vendors claim it. I'm not going to get into that fight. It's interesting reading if you want to do it later on tonight. Okay, but I'm going to give it to these guys. They wrote this fantastic book about it. Interestingly enough, they were trying to keep their employees from going to the Internet, not the other way around. Okay. Uh, but all the same technologies were used, so we're going to give these guys credit for the first firewall. All right? And back then, we told our bosses that we were doing defense in depth. And this, I've used a chart like this to describe what I did to my bosses. You know, it looks very complicated, overlapping concentric circles of security tools. And the idea is that the bad guy gets by one of them, he'll run into the next one, and that looks really important. But what we really did was install these three tools. Okay, we all had a firewall, we all had antivirus, and we all had intrusion detection back then. And you know, in the early, and, oh, uh, we had best practices that emerged during this time too. Three of them took, uh, that came out. One vendor in death, because you, everybody knows what this is? Because if we have, if we're gonna buy three security tools from a commercial vendor, we're not gonna use the same vendor because we don't trust those bastards, okay? All right. So we're gonna hire somebody else, okay? And then best of breed, if I'm gonna pick a firewall this year, I'm gonna bring all the firewalls into a lab, hit it over the head with a hammer and find the very best one. So that's best of breed. And then the last one is complexity is the enemy. Because whatever we do, we have to make it simple because if we misconfigure it, it's not gonna do any good anyway. So these are the three best practices that all of us have been using for the last 25 years, right? All right, and then back in the early days, this worked fine. When the adversary was not that mature, we were, this was a pretty effective way to stop bad guys from getting into your network. But as they got better at their craft, that became less and less so. And it's because uh, it wasn't very precise. We just kind of threw these tools out in our network and we hoped that the bad guys would run into them. And any bad guy worth their salt will find a way around that. So it really isn't a viable strategy anymore. But that's what we had. We had no other choices. And that's what we used. In fact, I talked to many people and say defense in depth is their strategy uh, in their own organizations. In 2004, this guy invents network sandboxing. This turned into uh, FireEye. Everybody knows what FireEye is, right? And then in 2007, our founder at Palo Alto Networks invented the next generation firewall, which is completely different from the old one that we were talking about before. In the old staple inspection firewalls, we block bad guys based on IPs, ports, and protocols. Uh, in these new next generation firewalls that all firewall vendors have now, not just us, but everybody has them, you block on applications tied to the authenticated user. So it's kind of a different way to do it, all right? And then in 2010, Eric Hutchins and his research team published their now famous paper, uh, lots of words in the title, lots of words, cyber kill chain, lots of words, lots of words in the title, all right? So, and this completely changed the industry because it gave us, gave us a lot more precision. Uh, the Lockheed Martin folks realized that as adversaries, the black hats of the world attacked their victims' networks, regardless of the tool set they used, and regardless of the motivations that drove them to do it, they all basically got to do the same five things to break into a network and be successful. They have to recon the ne victim's network looking for weaknesses. They craft a weapon that will leverage those weaknesses and deliver it to some endpoint somewhere, a laptop, a server, a printer, anything, it doesn't really matter. Once they get there, they trick the user into running that weapon against them and allows them to compromise that endpoint. I call that establishing a beachhead. Now, the adversary is not successful yet, okay, but now they are inside your network. From there, they usually create a command and control channel back out to the internet to download more tools that will help them finish their mission. And from there, the paper, the intrusion kill chain paper says, actions on the objective. And there's lots of things that can happen here, but generally, it's moved lateral in the victim's network, looking for the data they've come to steal or to destroy. And once they find it, they exfiltrate it out to, the, uh, uh, to, you know, to capture the information. All right, so that's the intrusion kill chain. And we know that the adversaries, regardless of their motivations, do all these things all the time, right? And so here's some examples. And I'm very particular here, right? Because I, you hear in the press all the time, wow, we're at cyber war. No, we're not at cyber war. Cyber war is different than cyber espionage, which is different than cyber crime, which is different from hacktivism, okay? There's different motivations behind it, right? The same tools are used, but there's reasons they are doing these things. So for cyber espionage, they're exfiltrating intellectual property in the commercial sense 
in the government sense, you know, uh, exfiltrating secret information, right? And probably the biggest uh, open uh, cyber espionage campaign is the OPM attacks from, what was that, a couple years ago? Was that last year? A couple years ago? Anybody know? Three years, five, four years ago. Man, it's, God, time goes by, right? Um, up there in the right corner is a book ab about the history of this, these kinds of activities. It's fantastic. It's from the Cybersecurity Canon Project. There's a bunch of books on that web page that you guys should be checking out. I'll talk about that later. Anyway, Fred's book is kind of a history of government cyber espionage, which is really good. In the OPM attacks, I, I put these two bullets on there just so you know. 22 million records stolen. Uh, there's only 3 million active government, government employees, so that means everybody that's ever been in the government and anybody that's retired got their records stolen too. Probably the worst breach ever, all right? And so that's, the, that's my favorite story about cyber espionage. For cyber crime, this has gone through a lot of phases, all right? But the latest trend in cyber crime is crypto jacking. Anybody doing Bitcoin or any of those things in the room? Okay. The, nobody is. Okay, it must be all government people, right? So, right. so the latest uh, phase in cybercrime is they don't actually break the blockchain technology, but what they do is they break into grandma's machines and use her machine to do the mining operations so they get additional Bitcoin. So it, it doesn't really harm anybody except maybe makes grandma's machine work a little bit more slowly, right? But uh, that's kind of been the latest trend lately. Uh, this paper was pre presented by the Cyber Threat Alliance. It's an information sharing organization of security vendors, and it just came out a couple of weeks ago. It's free. It's, it's a good read. You should have read it by now. Uh, for cyber hacktivism, the motivation behind these folks are is they're trying to change you or to harass you to change what you're doing, all right? Uh, in the, one of the latest ones, the, this lady, Linda, Lindy West, is a, a feminist, a very vocal feminist, and there's lots of trolls on the Internet that don't like her and hate her. So they broke into her computer, took all of her personal information and dumped it on a website somewhere for everybody to read. That's called doxing, right? And that's one of the tools into a hacktivist uh, tool belt. Cyber warfare, and this is what really cyber warfare is, okay? In order for it to be warfare, you have to kill people or destroy critical infrastructure. It has to be that, or it's not cyber warfare. You can point to Stuxnet and maybe a couple of examples where that actually happened. In the Stuxnet attacks, Government organizations from U.S. and Israel destroyed Iranian critical infrastructure in the form of building uh, nuclear energy or, or nuclear bombs, right? So that could be put in that category. And if you want a book about that, Countdown to Zero Day by Kim Zetter, uh, it gives you the complete story, all the technical details, uh, how it happened. It's a fascinating read. Cyber mischief is kind of the reason I like this field, right? They don't really do any harm, but uh, they're, they're trying to see what they can get into. Any zombie fans out there? Nobody's watching The Walking Dead? Okay, there, okay, some of you out there, okay, you're real true cybersecurity people, okay, for zombie folks, okay. All right, cyber terrorism uh, means you have to create fear in your employees or your citizens, um, and, it, and they don't really have to do anything, but the fear has to be involved there. All right, so the, one of the biggest examples of this is Saudi Aramco attacks. In those attacks, uh, we, uh, the consensus is somebody from Iran bricked about 30,000 computers by uh, oh, that oil company and caused all the employees to be fearful for what the next thing was going to be. So you can consider that a cyber terrorism attack. And the last one that we're all talking about now is not really a cybersecurity thing, but it's information uh, influence operations. You've all been paying attention to this. Okay, that pamphlet up there, uh, the Handbook of Russian Information Warfare, published uh, two years ago now, written by NATO, okay? That is a playbook of how the Russians do influence operations, and if you go through that, you can see everything they did for the Democratic National Committee's attacks, right? So you can see everything they were gonna do, they did it exactly that way. It's an interesting read. Uh, and we don't really have an answer for this, okay? None of us have solved this problem. Not really a cybersecurity problem, but uh, we get pinned with it because you know, it has security in the name. All right, so, all of those are the motivations, and we know that as adversaries, okay, run their campaigns against their victims, okay, we try to capture that using MITRE's attack framework. Anybody knows about MITRE's attack framework? You guys should know that, right? It's a standard way to say what the techniques are that the adversaries are using down the intrusion kill chain, so we're not all making it up ourselves. So if I share that with you, you understand what that is because you're using the same name that um, we're using, right? Uh, and they also, the adversaries also leave indicators of compromise behind in their wake when they do their attacks. These are clues that they have been there in your networks, right? So we try to capture all that stuff into something we call 
adversary playbooks, right? And we'll talk about that. Oh, we're going to talk about it right now. All right, so here's what we think an adversary playbook is. It's one or more adversaries, and this is important. The entire industry has gotten away from knowing there's a human on the other end of the keyboard with motivations, okay? And they, have a, they do the same things over and over again. What we've gotten into is sharing technical indicators of compromise with each other with no, uh, no context. And so we get bags and bags of indicators of compromise every day, and, we, and they say, hey, these are bad, do something with them, but we don't know why, and we can't keep up. So the idea is to make sure we understand the actual adversaries that are coming after you. All right. So in our adversary playbooks, it's one or more adversaries running one or more campaigns, and the campaign is nothing more than a time frame. Right? A campaign might be from June to July. The adversary will change something up, not everything, but a little something, and then run it again from October to November. So delineated by campaign, same adversaries though. So one or more adversaries running one or more campaigns. We collect all the attack techniques using the MITRE attack framework, and we collect all the indicators of compromise, and we wrap all that up into a sticks package and share that with each other. And why do we use MITRE's attack framework and MITRE's sticks package? Because now we can automate it all. We don't have humans reading this. You, now your computers can read this, and you can do something with, you can orchestrate this in your own organization, all right? All right, so I was going to talk about Oil Rig, which is a specific playbook, but one of my guys is here uh, going to give a very detailed discussion about this. So I'm going to skip through this real fast, right? Because he's going to talk about all this later on this afternoon. Uh, there's going to be a test on this later, by the way. All right. All right, so we think adversary playbooks okay, are the way to go. All right, you're talking about on the defender side, defenders playbooks about how do you orchestrate everything. What I'm telling you is we have intelligence on all the, or trying to collect the intelligence of all the adversaries that are out there. Here's the question. How many adversary playbooks are live on the internet on any given day? What do you think? Too many is a good answer. How many? Thousands. How many months go higher? Hundreds of thousands? Millions? You'll be surprised to know that most of us, most of the members of the Cyber Threat Alliance, these are all security vendors again, we think it's less than 100. Okay, and some of us think it's less than 50, right? So if we can capture every adversary playbook and keep them up to date, that's what I was talking about in the video, we can block probably 99% of what's going on on the internet on any given day. Because I'm telling you, the security vendors know 99% about what's going on on any given day. So we can get that shared to everybody that has prevention controls out there. We can get it all blocked. The problem is we haven't been able to automate that too well, and we'll talk about that in the future. All right, so. We want to put prevention and detection controls in place for everything that the adversaries are doing. And the reason we know what the adversary is doing is that white hat hackers and security vendors and government agencies, we find these things all the time because we are watching the adversaries operate on the internet. And we know that as the adversary runs their plays against multiple victims, they don't reinvent attacks for every new victim. They reuse them over and over and over again. Right? I lost my page here. Okay, they reuse them over and over again until someone like us figures out how to stop it. All right? So what that means to the industry is that we have enough intelligence to prevent most of the attacks that are on the internet on any given day. We just have to automate that process and get that done. So that's the big takeaway. Threat prevention is a way to convert uh, attack techniques and indicators of compromise into prevention controls in the tools you already have deployed. All right? And that's the great benefit we think that the intrusion kill chain paper gave us. We can now insert prevention controls for known adversaries at every phase of the intrusion kill chain. We thought this was going to change the world. We thought this was going to solve all of our problems. Did it? Did we solve all the hackers from working in the field? No, okay, because this caused all kinds of problems that we weren't anticipating, right? So the first one we have is we have way too many tools to manage now. Okay, from 2010 to 2018, the vendors came out of the, uh, out of the I don't know, where you call it, where do vendors hang out? Okay, in, in bad places, I guess, right? There is a tool for every place on the intrusion kill chain. There are multiple tools. How many people have been out to the RSA security conference? Okay, it's the biggest vendor conference on the planet. Last year, there were some 2,000 security vendors there. I know I, talk, I went walked the floor. Every single one of them has the tool that's going to save the internet. Every single one of them does. It's amazing, right? All right. And, but what's happened in the industry is that we deploy these things, 
And I get to go around and talk to a lot of network defenders in the world. Even small organizations have from 15 to 20 security tools deployed in their networks. Medium-sized companies have around 60, and big companies like big banks and big government, they have over 150 security tools deployed. I was talking to a big bank uh, on the East Coast uh, last Christmas. He claimed that he had 300 security tools deployed, and his performance objective for this year was to reduce that by half, and he would be successful. Nobody is gaping at that. I'm going, oh my, that's really 150. You get it down to 150 and you will be successful. That's amazing, all right? All right, and the dirty secret in the vendor community is that we make the network defenders integrate all that. At least that's what we did in the first evolution, okay? It was up to the network defender to put all those tools together and to make sense of everything, all right? And by the way, uh, the size of your InfoSec teams, they haven't gotten any bigger since the 19, in the early 1900s. They're the same size, all right? So we keep giving them all these tools to manage, and uh, it's becoming too much of a problem for them. And when you manage a point product, you got to buy the device, you got to buy a person who can maintain it, keep the blinky lights going, you got to have somebody on your staff that understands the data coming off the device, and then you need someone back in the SOC who's taking the data from all the devices and putting some coherent threat picture together, and that never happens because it's too much work to do, all right? We're at the point in our industry where we can't consume one more security product. It doesn't matter if somebody invents the, the, the secret tool of everything, we just can't consume it, okay? It's not possible to bring in and make it useful anymore. So that's one of the takeaways to the intrusion kill chain paper. We all have too many tools to manage and not enough people to do it. And we're trying to do it manually too, by the way. We don't have any automation that fixes all that. The second one, this is near and dear to my heart, uh, we ha are having trouble crossing the last mile with intelligence for all of our devices. Remember that threat prevention is putting prevention controls at every phase of the intrusion kill chain, right? And we have to keep those machines up to date, and most of us do that with threat intelligence. We either get that off the open source, where you can buy it through vendors, or you have your own intelligence group that does all that, okay? Uh, and we do that with feeds and other kinds of information flows, right? But uh, we are having trouble gathering all that information and actually putting it in to our devices, because again, we are doing it with people and not with automation. I was talking about it um, on the video. We are bringing people to a software fight, okay? The adversaries have already automated most of their uh, attack sequences, and we're trying to handle that with people, and that's just not gonna work go, going forward, all right? So with all those tools, it becomes impossible for your InfoSec staff to do all that. We are failing to put prevention controls and keep them up to date at every phase of the intrusion kill chain. All right, so that's the takeaway. We are not able to uh, cross the last mile with intelligence for the intrusion kill chain concept. Okay, take a deep breath. Whew, everybody with me so far? Three guys in the back falling asleep. It's okay, I, I give you, I, I, my wife is bored of me also. All right. All right, part two. We moved into the second evolution of our industry sometime in the mid-2000s, okay? In 2005, think about this, Concur becomes the first pure play SaaS provider, okay? Concur is, a, you guys are mostly government, do you know what Concur is? Yeah, okay, so first pure play. Now a lot of people wanna give that to Salesforce, um, but they weren't pure play until after this. They were kind of, they straddled both uh, sides uh, until then. So we're gonna give it to Concur. Uh, so pure play SaaS, meaning they deliver their services, you pay them money, so they do their service in the cloud and deliver it to you in your networks. You don't have their service in your perimeter, all right? Um, in 2006, Amazon Web Services come online to provide IaaS stuff, so now I don't have to put up a web server in my, in my data center, on my laptop or anywhere. I can now pay Amazon, I can just put a virtual web server up there and do all my business up there. Businesses and governments can now put applications in the cloud and they don't have to build the infrastructure themselves. So 2005, 2006, in 2014, I'll give a take or this, could go later than that, can go earlier than that, but it became acceptable for organizations to use uh, personal devices to do work. That came faster in the commercial space, the government people are slowly coming around to that idea, but we're all gonna get there. That means you can use your phone, you can use your iPad, and you can use your laptop to do your personal work, not behind the big perimeter defenses that you have. So sometime around there is when that came into being, all right? So, so what's happened is we have now created all these data islands. We are no longer behind the perimeter, you guys know that already, but we have all these places where government and commercial data sits. 
and it's become a nightmare for the InfoSec team to try to protect all that because what's happened is, you remember, we were trying to do prevention controls all the way down the kill chain at every place there's data, right? And we're, it's almost impossible to do what we had in the old days, and now I have it in five or six different locations, and I'm not in control of most of those locations. So what's emerged in the industry is all of these vendors have said, well, we have security tools that you can buy from us that will help us in every one of these locations. So now that has exponentially grown the number of tools that we all need to secure our data. And we couldn't do it before this. All right, and now we're trying to do all of this at the same time with all these different places. And you look at your InfoSec team, it's the reason they look the way they do, right? Okay, they're, it is the reason they're not the beautiful people, okay? I'm just saying. All right, so the emerging solution in, in evolution two is the power of the platform, all right? So what th we invented this back in 2014, but all of the firewall vendors do this and other kinds of security vendors do this too, and it's the idea that you put most of the prevention controls into one box from one vendor and let them do most of the work for you so your InfoSec team can get on to doing other things. That's the idea, all right? So, this is a government crowd, I know you guys are just going, oh, we'll never do that because it's horrible, right? But let me just talk about that, okay? If you were going to invent a magic box that did all this, what would it have to do? Before you would even consider it, what would you, what would you want it to do? All right, so first, it would have to have complete visibility. You would have to use the same technology on all of those data islands. You would have to be able to put the same security policy on all those devices everywhere it goes, and would it have to be managed seamlessly from one interface. If you were gonna do this, it would at least have to give you that. The second thing it would have to do is help you reduce the attack surface. Okay, it had to be easy to say things like, the marketing department can go to Facebook, but nobody else can. Okay, it had to be easy to do those kinds of rules. The third thing is, it would have to prevent all the known threat activity out there. Okay, uh, on its own, automatically, with no humans in the loop, but it had to do all that, or why would you even consider it? And the last thing it would have to do is discover new threats quickly and turn them into known threats and get them automatically blocked, all right? So if you could have all of these things in a single box, this is what it gives you, all right? It gives you automatically integrated because it's one, but run by one vendor. That means your guys are not doing that. It's automatically orchestrated, receiving intelligence, updates, and preventing, putting prevention controls everywhere you want it to go automatically crosses the last mile with intelligence, less waste of time, less complexity, this all sounds great, and then boom, single vendor. Okay, and everybody in this room is going, yeah, you're right, I'm never gonna buy that, it's a single vendor, okay? All right, so that's a problem, all right? So, and remember, we said best practices are vendor in depth, so that violates that problem, okay, and best of breed, so you're not getting the, probably the very best in every one of those tools down the intrusion kill chain because you're not going through that analysis anymore, so why would we even bother with that? Hmm, all the old timers in the room, okay, do you remember this debate from before, back in the early 2000s? We were talking about another thing that we would never want a single vendor for. Do you remember what it was? Any old guys in here? Old men and women? Nobody remembers, okay? Do you remember we were all worried about Windows? Do you remember we were all worried, oh, it's one operating system that the entire world is using. It's very insecure because if some bad guy finds a way to break it, they can break into literally every computer on the planet. We were all worried about that, and some very smart uh, security leaders back in the day wrote a really great white paper about this problem and what they want Microsoft to do to fix it. So it's Bruce Schneier and a bunch of really smart people. And here's what they recommended in their paper. Microsoft should publish interface specifications so people can write to the operating system to help make it more secure. They should foster plug and play so other kind of tools can work with the operating system easily. It doesn't have to go through Microsoft. And they should cooperate with other vendors so it's easy to do things. If another vendor has an idea, they don't have to be bought by Microsoft to make it work. Microsoft essentially did all that, okay? So do we talk about Windows as the, uh, the monopoly operating system on the planet anymore? No, because they basically did all these things. It is the same argument for the cybersecurity defender platform, okay? So, I, in fact, I'm gonna tell you, we need to jettison these uh, two uh, best practices anyway. They've got us to the problem we are in now. I'm telling you the new best practice that all of us should use is seek vendors that integrate. If you are buying new security tools this year, if they don't integrate with what you already have, why are you putting that on your InfoSec team? Okay, why are you doing that? Right? Insist that they integrate with what you have or don't buy them. Okay, that's the bottom line. Whew, take a deep breath. Everybody with me so far? 
All right, so we are still in the second evolution. Everybody talked about orchestration in that video. I wanna talk about how the security vendor community is doing it, and how many folks have heard about the Cyber Threat Alliance? Some of you, okay. It's, a, it's kinda like an ISAC for security vendors, and we were late to the game. The vendor community was late to the game on this. There's a ISAC, or an information sharing organization, for every vertical on the planet. Finance, IT, telecom, health, you can name it, we have it. The security vendors didn't want to do it because they had a really unique argument. Well, we don't like each other. Okay. Like that never happened in all those other industries, right? So we formed the Cyber Threat Alliance, okay, to fix that. These are the board members of the Cyber Threat Alliance. It was a, turned into a nonprofit last year. You will see some of the companies from the biggest cybersecurity vendor community out there who believe in the idea that we should share threat intelligence with each other to better support our customers so that our customers don't have to do that themselves. And there's a couple of underwriting principles here. Okay, the first thing is, and this is the problem with all the ISACs, by the way, okay? The ISACs are great and they're fantastic organizations. Everybody points to the financial sector ISAC as being the best information sharing on the planet, and they are, all right? But even the FS ISAC has two big problems, and one of them is not everybody shares, okay? Just the big guys share, you know, Bank of America's and the Goldman Sachs. But with all their members, all that local community bank down the street, they have two guys and a dog in the back room running the firewall and the printer and getting coffee in the morning. They don't have time to figure out what intelligence to share. They just, don't, they just can't get it done. So as a rule to get in the Cyber Threat Alliance, the vendors have to share, and we measure it daily. You have to meet a minimum point value, right? And if you don't meet the minimum points, we kick you out of the club. All right, so we are getting data from every member of the Alliance every day, right? And that is a fantastic set of data that we didn't have, you know, three years ago, all right? What are we sharing? Adversary playbooks, automatically, okay? Automatically. At Palo Alto Networks and my threat intelligence team, Unit 42, discover some new thing. We can convert that into multiple prevention controls down the intrusion kill chain, deliver it to 55,000 customers around the world in five minutes. In five minutes, that is amazing capability. All these other vendors in the Alliance, they could do something similar, ours is better, okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> the idea then is that if we find something new out there, we can get prevention controls distributed around the planet in minutes to hours, all done automatically, okay? That's what we're trying to go for. We are not there yet. We don't have enough vendors in the Alliance, and I'll talk about that in a second, all right? This is automatic orchestration. This is what everybody is talking about, all right? You're gonna do it inside your own organizations with all the other tools you have, but the vendors are trying to get this done for you because we believe threat intelligence is a commodity. You should not be paying for that. At least you should not be paying for this kind of intelligence, right? What you should be paying the vendors for is how well does your product work, all right? So we're gonna compete in the marketplace in that area, but not in threat intelligence, right? All right, these are the current members of the Cyber Threat Alliance. There's gonna be an announcement tomorrow. We're adding four new members to the Alliance. That's fantastic, all right? But look at the people on this group, okay? And then you have to ask yourself, is your vendor on the, in the Alliance? Okay, and how come they're not, all right? So that's my ask to all of you. If you got vendors coming in selling you stuff, ask them why they're not a member of the Cyber Threat Alliance. And if you're doing an RFP this year, Put it in the RFP questions and make them answer it in writing. You can still choose them if you want, but make them go through that pain, all right, and then point them to me when they have enough pain so we can get them in the Alliance. It costs you no money, it makes the, the community better, and the Alliance need new members to make it stable, all right? So that's my ask to all of you, all right? Now, and just to tie it into what you guys do, these are all the vendors that are helping the ICD with their uh, defenders playbooks, right? Um, these are the members of also of the Cyber Threat Alliance. Notice how many gray boxes there are, okay? And if I could direct you to a few, okay? These are the people we want, right? So please, show them to me. They need to be in the Cyber Threat Alliance, okay? We really like to get Microsoft in there. We really like to get Carbon Black and all the rest of them here, right? Any, if there's any reps in here, I will gladly talk to you at the end of the meeting, right? All right, and also more importantly, as the IACD does their work, this is their model for helping the FSISAC. What I propose is that we, in, instead of them developing their own standards for stack, sticks and taxi, why don't we just insert the adversary playbook model so we're all on the same sheet of music, right? Let's get this standardized, right? Okay, take a deep breath. We're almost through. How much time am I doing? Am I okay? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go, so, because whatever, okay. So, 
But we've done the second evolution. Let's talk about where it's going, okay? And this is brand new, but I believe this is where the industry is going, all right? So if you talk about firewalls in the uh, first evolution, okay, um, they did a bunch of things, all right? And basically, if you abstract it up, they basically do three things. They collect intelligence, they process the intelligence looking for bad guys, and if they find them, they try to block them, all right? So that's what the firewall did in the first evolution. In the second evolution, all the firewall vendors uh, changed their tactics, okay? They started moving the intelligence piece and the processing piece up to the cloud because we essentially have infinite storage up there and infinite processing up there. If we tried to put all that on the hardware box, it would fall over because it'd be too many things to do. And we've all had immense success of that. We've, we've boatloads of money have rolled into all the firewall vendors because of this new model. It just makes it easier for us to deliver services. We were able to put prevention control services or uh, prevention uh, services to our customers from the cloud, right? Uh, at Palo Alto Networks, we don't even consider ourselves to be a hardware manufacturer anymore. We consider ourselves to be a software company. We deliver security services from the cloud. We are a SaaS provider, all right? So here's where it's going in the third evolution. If we had success with our own, process, our own apps in the cloud, and we're trying to integrate and orchestrate everything, what if we created an Apple store for cybersecurity uh, services, right? Where we would put Checkpoint, Cisco, Fortinet, McAfee, Palo Alto Network, semantic apps in the cloud, it would see the data that gets collected from the infrastructure underneath it, they'd run their magic algorithms on it, all right, and then deliver uh, blocking instructions to the already installed base, all right? So you might buy, buy an intrusion detection system from Checkpoint, you might buy uh, command and control from Cisco, you might buy uh, I don't know, pick your services that you need, behavioral analytics, whatever, okay, from each of these, and see how they do. And if you don't like any of those, you can go get Bob's security service, all right, because now, if you have an interesting idea, like those 2,000 vendors at the uh, RSA conference, they no longer have to form a company to deliver those services. They, did, they write some software and put it in the store. All right, so now you can run Bob security service, and you can run checkpoints, and you can run Palo Alto networks, run them in uh, parallel, Right, and see which one you like. You may decide you like Bob's security servers over the other two. Turn the other two off, run Bob's, and see how it goes for a while. All right? and, and it's your data, so you can run, build your own tools in it. All right? I think this is the future. Okay? This is the way it's going to go for most of the security vendors. Point products in 10 years are going to disappear. Okay? They're going to be delivered from the cloud, and you're going to pick a infrastructure person on the bottom, it'll be one of the firewall vendors, probably, maybe somebody else, but that's where it's gonna go. But we're gonna have security store just like Apple, all right? So it's not longer a software as a service, it's security as a service delivered from the cloud, and that, that is just beginning, okay? We're in the early stages of that, but see, you're gonna see that in two or three years, and you should be thinking about how that changes your approach to defending your perimeter. Okay, I'm gonna to change topics completely just for a second and hit one of my pet peeves. We're all InfoSec professionals, all network defenders, all right, and so how do you improve your craft? How do you become the best uh, information security professional on the planet? Okay, how many people have heard of the Cybersecurity Canon Project? Hint, hint, I talked about it earlier, so you should all be raising your hands, all right, if you were paying attention, except for that guy, he was sleeping, okay. Whew, you guys are dead, all right? <laughs> Wake up, all right? <laughs> All right, so this started a number of years ago um, where we decided that if you, were, if you were, as a professional, wanted to read a book this year and get smart about something new, you might go out to Amazon and uh, look up cybersecurity books. Do you know how many books you'd get back in that return? About 2,000, all right? So how do you decide which ones you want to do? So we formed a group called the Cybersecurity Canon Project, and are we sports people or music people? Sports, we'll go sports, all right? We created the Baseball Hall of Fame for cybersecurity books. We have a group of outside committee members. Some of that's kind of ugly, okay? Um, but uh, uh, these guys and gals read the books, and they write a book review for it, and they put the, they put the book into one of three categories. Either it's a must read for all cybersecurity professionals, or second, maybe not a must read, but if you're reading about this topic, this is a good book for it. And third, most importantly, the service we give back to the community is do not read. Because there's a lot of crap cybersecurity books out there, right? So, uh, so we want to make sure you pick the right ones. Uh, we've been doing this now for about five years. We got about 18 or 19 books 
in the Hall of Fame. So if you haven't read any of these books yet, these are the ones you should start with. All right, and uh, there's about 70 books in the candidate list that might make it to the Hall of Fame at some point. So if you get through this list, you should absolutely go start on the candidate list, okay? And we run a gala awards dinner every year. I dress up in tucks and tails. I give away Academy Award style trophies to the authors. We fly them out to the ceremony. Uh, what you're looking at over here on the left side, uh, that's Mark Bowden. He wrote a fantastic book about, called Worm, about the conficker uh, situation we had a number of years ago. Anybody know who Mark Bowden is? He wrote Black Hawk Down, right? He wrote the screenplay to Black Hawk Down. He's written a bunch of books about everything. His book on Vietnam this year is fantastic. Anyway, he came out and gave a great speech. Uh, Rick Ledgett gave the keynote speaker, and those are the Hall of Fame uh, entries for this year, all right? And so I want to pick my favorite book. Do you have a great book you all like? Anybody got a favorite? Which one? Site Reliability Engineering. Okay, that's a fantastic book. Okay, but if you're new to DevOps, don't start there. It's pretty, it's pretty technical, okay? I would start with the Phoenix Project. That'd give you an intro to it, then do that one. It's a great book. Um, I want to talk about the Cuckoo's Egg. How many people have read the Cuckoo's Egg? Oh, I don't have to tell the story then. I'm going to anyway, because, you know, that's the way it goes. Clifford Stoll, oops, sorry. Clifford Stoll wrote the book. All right, he is a Berkeley astronomer, Berkeley, Northern California. So think about what that means to you. He's a lefty liberal. Okay, now there are, there's center, there's leftist, there's a little bit left of that, there's lefty liberals, and then there's Cliff. He's way over on the left side. He makes his own clothes, he gardens his own food, he makes his own shoes, he's got tattoos, he's got earrings, he's got long hair. He's that guy, right? Um, but he's well liked, he's really funny, and he's a Berkeley astronomer, but the astronomy department is laying off their astronomers. But everybody likes Cliff, and the IT department says, hey, Cliff, come over and work for us. We have this Unix lab that we need someone to run, and your job will come open in a year, you can go back to it in a year, but in the meantime, you can help us out, so come work for us. Oh, no, by the way, there's a 75 cent accounting error in the student database records. Back then, we charged students for computer time, and the entire uh, student body at Berkeley, it was off by 75 cents every month, and no one knew how to fix it. So Cliff, come run the Unix lab, go run down this error, you'll be a hero to us, everything will be great. That 75 cent accounting error was the first public cyber espionage campaign run by the Russians hiring East German uh, hacker mercenaries that broke into U US university systems to break into government systems because back then the internet was just strings and cans, there wasn't any security anywhere, right? So Cliff writes the book about his efforts to track down these, uh, this first cyber espionage campaign, all right? He basically invents an incident response, the same things that he did back in those days, back in the late 80s, okay, we are still doing today, the same troubles he runs into today about notifying people about what's going on and getting help from the government, we are still running in today, all right? Uh, so, and there's a love story, my wife read this, loved it, okay? There's even a chocolate chip cookie recipe that I've tried, okay? So, you should all read this, and uh, it's, if you haven't read it at all, I, this is the book I give to any new boss coming in that's never heard about cybersecurity. It's a nice, easy way to learn about our craft, and then work your way down the rest of the list, all right? All right, and so I am at the end, okay? I do have a reminder about what we talked about. We talked about the cybersecurity evolutions one, two, and three. We talked about kill chain problems, the power of the platform, vendor integration, automatic orchestration, adversary playbook, the security app store, and please go check out my uh, cybersecurity Canon project. I do have homework because it's kind of an academic institution here for the rest of you. All right, and so in the next week, you should take time to consider the platform model, right? And not the way we're doing it now. I will tell you that I can have a long uh, risk argument about what the risk is uh, buying a platform versus buying 150 different security tools that don't talk to each other. So please consider that. All right, review the Cybersecurity Canon website. And if you are buying any kind of security kit this year, ask them why they're not a member of the Cyber Threat Alliance. And in the next six months, you should be reading at least one of the books in the Hall of Fame to see if you like it, okay? And then think about, as you go forward this year, how a security app store is gonna change how you do security in your environments in the coming years. All right, um, I really am done this time. Whew. Thank you.